Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wishnick. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much to Portland State University for inviting me and to the Institute of Asian Studies in particular, as well as the Northwest China Council and the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. So we just heard Secretary Albright talk about all the top issues in U.S.-China relations, and she did not mention food safety. Uh, but some of the issues that she did talk about are related to our subject, in that she mentioned the economic interdependence between the United States and China, and certainly the trade in food is a big part of that. And she also mentioned China's terrible environmental situation, which also uh, is a big issue in terms of food safety in China. And finally, she discussed the growing gap between the rich and poor in China. And we do see that in terms of access to safe food in China. So food safety is a problem for Chinese people, um, as well as a problem for all of us here in this country. And so first, I'm going to introduce you to some of the problems with food safety in China and give you some background about that. And then I'll uh, talk about um, how this affects us in terms of U.S.-China cooperation in food safety and looking at the state of Oregon in particular. Okay, so um, this gives you a little bit of history in terms of how we approach the topic of food in China. Because I don't know if you remember a book published by Lester Brown um, nearly 20 years ago that that asked dramatically, who will feed China? And in those days, everyone was preoccupied with the growing demand for food that China's very large population would have. And would there be enough food in the world to feed China? What would that mean for all of us? And the Chinese government has been very worried about this issue and has accumulated very large stockpiles of grains, nearly twice the amount the UN recommends for a state, because they they do see a concern uh, with political stability in the event of um, inadequate food supplies. But now that China is a player in the global economy, um, the concern has shifted to what is China feeding us, not so much who will feed China, because China is the world's largest exporter of food. And so although China does face concerns with supplies, uh, the the, the international focus has really changed to what is in the food that China is sending um, to the rest of all of us. The Chinese government, though, although, while concerned with food safety, its priority is on political stability. So they're concerned primarily with the food prices, inflation, because inflation in food prices has led to unrest. If you think back to the Tiananmen protests in 1989, a big issue at that time was food prices, and that brought people out into the streets as much as other concerns. So they're concerned about prices, and they're concerned about uh, food safety crises leading to political instability. And they're also concerned about the reputation of Chinese products and the legitimacy of the Chinese government, which is supposed to be ensuring the safety of Chinese people. So they look at it from a different point of view. From, from our perspective in the United States, we're looking at trade, trying to balance our concerns with expanding U.S.-China trade, and also um, balancing that with the safety of the products that we are, we are importing from China. So historically, China was a recipient of food aid. It received a billion dollars in food aid from the beginning of the reform era to 2005. And then this aid stopped as China began to aid other countries with food supplies itself. So China is now the third largest donor of food aid. Um, so China's position as a, from a recipient country to a donor country shows the dramatic rise of China economically. But there are also some, some uh, have-nots in China who don't get enough to eat. And if you look at statistics in terms of poverty, there are still 200 million people classified by the World Bank as poor in China, meaning they live on less than, uh, than a, they live on about $1.25 a day. And, and then there, within that number, there, there are some 65 million people who can be considered truly very poor. 
And then 10% of the Chinese population in general can be considered undernourished. And so there's a, there's a difference in terms of access to safe and nutritious food within China itself. And this is just a, a table to show you how diets have changed in China from the beginning of the reform era, 1978 to uh, about 2007 when this data was compiled. And it shows that rural people and urban people live in different food worlds, so to speak. That rural people still depend more on grains than urban people. And urban people have increased the amount of protein in their diet through pork, and poultry, and eggs. And this is important because when urban people who are now um, nearly the majority of people in China start eating more meat, this requires more grains for feeding the livestock. This requires more water because you need 10 times the amount of water to raise livestock than you do for agriculture. Um, and so it has all kinds of consequences for the environment. And so you have rural people still constrained in their diets and urban people changing their diets. Okay, this is connected to China's environmental problems. We heard Madeleine Albright talking about how you can, can't see out your hotel window in China because of the terrible air pollution. Um, but water pollution is a really important problem uh, for agriculture, as is the pollution and contamination of the land. So if you need more water to raise more livestock and grow more food, then China faces many challenges in terms of an acute water scarcity, <coughs> an imbalance in the location of water, and, and the location of population centers. So Northeast China faces water scarcity. A lot of the population is living in the coastal areas in Eastern China. Um, and then you have problems with, flood, with flooding in southern China, where most of the water resources are, and you have terrible water pollution problems. So uh, if you look at the statistics about water pollution in China, 75% of China's water is unfit for agricultural use, and 28% of water is fit, unfit for industrial use. So that's horrifying statistics in terms of the cleanliness of the water. And you think there is an alternative water, and so if you have scarce water supplies, you're gonna be using whatever water there is to irrigate, irrigate crops. Fish farming has become an important industry in China. Most of the Chinese fish are far farmed rather than caught wild, and this creates additional sources of water pollution. Pesticide use is a big issue in China. China's both the largest pesticide producer and user, and these pesticides uh, are found in agricultural runoff. And then finally, you have industrial pollution that contaminates farmland in addition. And so you have multiple environmental threats that affect the food supply. China is trying to do something about its environment, and a piece of this is to use biofuels. Um, but this also has an impact on agriculture and um, availability of water and land. Um, so the Chinese government has tried to limit the use of food crops for biofuels and importing them rather than using uh, food crops grown in China for biofuels. And so for this reason, China's been increasing its imports of grains. Um, also, there's inadequate land and water to meet the biofuel <coughs> demand projections that the Chinese government has set for the, the uh, next decade. Okay, and then this leads us to the topic of food safety risk. So if we understand the, the resource constraints, inadequate <coughs> clean water, and uh, a large pollution problem due to industry, pesticide use, and other factors. Now, this, what this slide tries to show you is that it's a very hard problem um, to get a handle on in China in general because of the way the economy is set up. And we think of China as an authoritarian country. And in fact, it has a very decentralized economy. And this is particularly true in the food industry. So there are 10 million food-related 
businesses that are registered in China. And you know that where there are registered businesses, there are millions of unregistered businesses. And so there are 480,000 licensed food processing enterprises. And so that's more than double the number that we have in this country. So it's a huge number of very small companies. So 80% of these companies employ fewer than 10 workers. So we think of big state-owned companies, well that's part of the puzzle of the Chinese food production. But they depend on suppliers who have very small staffs who cannot all possibly be, reg <coughs> be regulated. Now, if you look at the dairy sector, which I've focused on in some of my work, 65% uh, of milk producers in China are household farms. And the, uh, most of them, so 80% of these household farms, have between one and five cows. So if you're talking about farm-to-table food safety, it's not possible. You have millions of Chinese farmers with between one and five cows. How are you going to regulate them all? So, and so it's, it's just not possible to have that kind of regulation. And in general, rural areas in China, which make up half of the Chinese population, are less regulated than urban areas. And, but if you're going to be concerned about regulating food safety, you have to focus more on the rural areas. Um, and to make things more complicated, there are a lot of constraints uh, placed on the media and in, on, on um, non what pass for non-governmental organizations in China on reporting food safety violations. Because the information about food safety violations is seen as posing a threat to political stability and in some way to the legitimacy of the government. And this is changing to some extent, but still there are certain <coughs> taboos in terms of discussion. So here is a list of scandals from the last five years. Um, the, the one on top, um, you may be familiar with. And before I go into this, I should say that I'm not saying that it's only China that has food safety problems. Um, if I'm an avid reader of food safety news, I don't know if anyone here reads that, but it tells you that every day in the United States there's another food safety problem. But what's different about our problems and the problems we know about in China is that our problems come from an industrialized food system, factory farms, um, and contamination of processes that happen inadvertently or due to sloppy hygiene or uh, practices in these kinds of industries. These scandals I'm listing here are reflect intentional doctoring of food products for usually for profit motive. But, but that doesn't mean that China doesn't have the other problems, salmonella, botulism that we know about in our food supply. These are just the ones we hear about. So um, not the ones we're not, I mean, I'm sure the other problems exist there too, we just don't know about them. So these are the more spectacular cases that we've heard about over there in the last five years. The melamine case, was, which was how I got started in this topic. I was doing research in Hong Kong in 2008 about something else and then this scandal erupted about uh, the introduction of melamine, which is a compound found in plastics and fertilizers, into infant formula. And this was done because at that time, uh, milk supplies were monitored for protein content by looking for nitrogen. And uh, milk didn't have to be guaranteed as 100% milk in those days. <laughs> and so they were testing for nitrogen, but not seeing what, whether the contents was 100% milk. And so melamine gave a false impression of a higher protein content in milk. So that's why um, it was introduced. And so you had big state-owned companies selling a product that they had received from middlemen who, who were the ones who introduced the melamine into the milk. So they bought the milk from the farmer who had four cows. The milk goes to the middleman. The middleman put the melamine in the milk and then sold it to the big company. And so that's how you have a difficult supply chain situation where you have a big state-owned company that should be able to regulate things, but the supply chain goes to very small and random characters and from below that. And so as a result, six babies died and almost 300,000 
fell ill. Um, the rest, oops, here are some here are some dramatic photos to illustrate what I was just talking about. Uh, you have 16,000 pigs floating in the Huangpu River near Shanghai. These were pigs that were diseased, and because there was inadequate place to treat diseased pigs, the farmers dumped them in the river. And that lady in the bottom, black, not looking too happy, has had her watermelon crop explode um, because there was a growth accelerator that was uh, put in the watermelons at the wrong moment, causing them to explode instead of to grow. Um, the latest, one of the latest scandals is the, it reflects the picture in the far right corner, which is gutter oil. So this is the oil that restaurants uh, dispose of at the end of their day. And so unscrupulous people would gather that oil and then resell it as cooking oil. And so you notice how dark the oil is if you think of what canola oil looks like. It's a much yellower kind of oil. And so this oil was used in, in large quantities uh, by other restaurants and um, home, you know, people cooking at home because, uh, because of undoubtedly the price was cheaper. And so um, there was three million tons of this gutter oil that was sold. So huge, huge problem. And to, to try to get a handle on this problem, the Chinese government was trying to encourage restaurants to sell their gutter oil for use in biodiesel. So it was a way to <coughs> find an alternative use for this product. Uh, we'll go back to that slide. Um, a variety of industrial contaminants are found in, in a large range of products. Um, most recently, cadmium and rice. So 44% of the rice in Guangzhou, a major city in southern, southeastern China, was found to be contaminated with cadmium. And 10% of Chinese rice overall is believed to be contaminated with cadmium. Um, and this wasn't intentional. This happened from industrial use. So it was gutter oil that was trying to uh, repurpose a disposable item to make a profit. Um, steroid clombuterol found in pigs. So that's the steroid favored by bicyclists wanting to get ahead. And what it does is that it, it makes the muscle meat appear leaner. And so pigs were uh, given that steroid. Um, expired foods have been found to have been uh, repurposed by bleaching them and, and adding other, other kinds of chemicals to make them look fresher. And then another recent case was we found that uh, rat meat was substituted for lamb meat in some places. So here you look on the left, that's the real lamb meat. And then rat meat or fox meat was substituted for lamb. And if you look at the fat marbling, it's slightly different, but unless you're accustomed to buying fox meat, you probably wouldn't know that, um, that you were not getting lamb. Um, so consumer beware. There's a lot of these, a lot of these problems. Um, so the Chinese government is very aware that this has been happening and has been trying to take a series of steps to, to address these problems. So new laws were passed, new institutions were created. Um, the first, the head of the State Food and Drug Administration, so the equivalent of our FDA, he was executed <coughs> in 2007. And that was over a corruption scandal over pharmaceuticals. Um, so a lot of stiff penalties, food safety reviews, and finally infant formula is gonna be sold as a drug in pharmacies to try to ensure that the, pro the production process can be traceable. So the Chinese government has been trying to do a lot, of, a lot of different things to stop this problem, but it's very hard to do because of the decentralization of the food processing economy that I mentioned. There are so many actors throughout this system that it's very hard to get a handle of it. On it, you don't have an adequate system of law, and you don't have an, um, a society that's able to speak out about these problems and or media able to call attention to them sufficiently. 
Uh, nonetheless, Chinese citizens are taking matters into their own hands to some extent, um, and they have different coping mechanisms. Some think buying local is the solution. And there is a CSA movement in China, Community Supported Agriculture. It's very small in China. There are about 100 CSAs in China compared to more than 12,000 here in the United States. Um, this little donkey farm, which is located near Be Beijing, was founded by a, a student who spent time in Minnesota on a CSA and came back and started a CSA back in China. Some, uh, some Chinese uh, colleagues, some, I know will we'll go to their local farmer's market and then follow the farmer back to the farm and buy directly from the farmer. And not buy from the farmer what the farmer sells to everybody else, which are the beautiful vegetables and fruits that have been treated with pesticides, but the, but the produce that the farmer wants to keep for his family, which have the little holes from insects, and so that you know that there, there's no pesticide being used. And so um, that's one strategy people use. Restaurant owners have become very worried about eating even in their own restaurants because of all the practices that I told you about gutter oil and rat meat. And, and so they want, they, some of them have started banding together to create a, some kind of guarantee to, for their customers that you can eat safely in their restaurant. Uh, one of the most interesting developments is a food safety portal. Um, this is a, started by a student, Wu Hong, in Shanghai, and he created this portal called Throw It Out the Window, uh, which um, is a comment supposedly attributed to Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who, after reading uh, The Jungle, looked at his sausage and threw it out the window um, because he was afraid of what might be in it. And so this portal asked Chinese citizens around the country to report on whatever food safety violations they have seen and to rate the worst ones. And following uh, Wendy Northcutt, Northcut, who set up the Darwin Awards for the best um, examples of human stupidity, Wu Hung set up an award for the worst food safety violator. And the prize is 1.4 yuan, 22 cents. But in Chinese, 1.4 yuan is a homonym for the, for the phrase, we all die, yi <laughs> se. Um, <laughs> so so he's, uh, it's kind of some dark humor about what it is to be a prize winner in terms of being the worst food safety violator. Um, so far, Wu Hong is still in business. Um, the Shanghai government came to visit him, which made him very nervous. But so far, they've just given him some funding, although he, he worries that now he's under scrutiny. Um, but so far, he's been able to continue operating. And sometimes, he's gotten as many as 5 million hits on his website during a food safety crisis. Um, the, the last option that this is available to wealthier citizens who don't want to buy anything Chinese at all, they would prefer to buy farm products if they have access to them. And so this is the middle class who can travel, can go to foreign supermarkets and buy foreign meat, Australian milk, and other products that are not always available to poor Chinese. So here is some data from a Pew Foundation study um, taken in the past year about what Chinese people think about a certain number of issues. And if you notice, food safety is the issue that seems to have grown uh, most in the awareness of, of people. Maybe corruption and air pollution are seen, seen as worse problems, but the safety of food certainly has been attracting more and more attention. And who is paying attention? Well, younger people, and wealthier people, and urban people. But this is unfortunate because it's the rural people who really get the worst food of all. And there's some evidence that, that the worst food is dumped in rural areas where people have fewer alternatives in terms of processed foods. I mean, because if, uh, people who grow food can grow some of their own food and try to limit the exposure of contaminants. 
Um, but in terms of processed food, there's the least regulation of the food that is accessible to rural residents. And they have the fewest alternatives in terms of being able, they cannot afford foreign food or to go um, overseas to buy food. So they have, they're stuck with what's available in their small community. So this is a terrible problem for people living in China, and then it's also a problem for all of us, because China is now the world's largest exporter of food products. And because of the way the, the global food industry works, the food supply is a global one, and we just don't know what's in it. And so uh, that's one problem that I'm going to talk about. The other problem is that food markets are affected when Chinese go looking for food products they don't trust at home especially infant formula. We've seen that clearly in Asia, where Hong Kong and Australia had to put restrictions on the number of, of infant formula packages uh, a foreigner could buy in, or a non-resident could buy in their community because so many large numbers of Chinese, mainland Chinese, were coming to buy infant formula. And that's, we've seen these kinds of purchases um, in Europe as well. So, this, this is a power bar. You probably have eaten one recently. Um, but what you don't know is that uh, the ingredients from this power bar come from six to eight countries. Mm -hmm. And so at the time when we had the milk scandal in China in 2008, um, if you look on the back of your power bar, you might see an ingredient called casein. Casein is a, is a milk byproduct. And some major brands, like Nestle and Latte and, and others, had to withdraw products because it, it contained Chinese milk products. But if you read the back of your power bar, you don't see made in China um, as an ingredient. Because in our country, um, we're, the FDA only requires certain products be identified in terms of country of origin. So that's uh, meat. Um, fruits and vegetables, certain nuts, um, and basically that's it. So we, so we don't know um, in terms of ingredients and processed food where they come from. And my colleagues in food science tell me that even food producers don't know from one batch to another of a product in terms of what the country of origin is for a particular ingredient. They just don't keep those detailed records. And so when you eat something that's processed, you have no idea what country of origin, and what is the country of origin of the ingredients in that food. And so here you see China producing vitamins, minerals, honey, um, in these two different power bars there. And so this is an area, this is one of those areas that I think Secretary Albright would agree where the U.S. and China have a common interest in doing something about the problem together. Um, and so we have been trying to do something um, about food safety with China uh, because we have been directly affected. If you remember back in 2007, the blood thinning drug heparin uh, was linked to 149 deaths in the United States and the problem was um, contaminated pig intestines, which came from small farms in China, again. Uh, pet food contaminated with melamine was found, um, contributing to the illness and, and death of pets in this country, as well as a massive recall. And more recently, there were some issues with beef jerky made in China for pet use. Um, so there are some direct impacts on the United States. And when we think that China is now the third largest source of agricultural products and seafood imported to the U.S., this is a, a serious concern for public health. But the problem is in, that the inspection process is very costly. It costs $16,000 to inspect a plant in, in, in a foreign country, and the FDA has a small budget. And so that means that uh, not more than 3% of of all food imports that we get are inspected. Um, we just recently increased the number of personnel from the FDA that's in China, so we now have a total of 13 people um, <laughs> working in China 
That's 13 more than we had before, but uh, that, that doesn't really cover the whole country in terms of inspections. So in 2011, there were 85 inspections in China in terms of food safety. And so it's, it's a matter of cost, it's a matter of personnel. And so increasingly what we're trying to do is rely on companies in this country as well as in other countries to ensure the safety of their supply chain. Uh, we did sign an agreement with China uh, six years ago to improve food safety, to try to share best practices, to um, have workshops, and um, that agreement paved the way for these new staff to work in China. But this is a drop in the bucket when you think about the problems that are involved. So what do we buy from China? Uh, this is the U.S. as a whole. Uh, we buy um, uh, some food products and some drug and some drug components, uh, vitamins and such. So overall, not, pretty small amounts so far, but certain products are heavily represented, like tilapia, fish tilapia, 80% of it comes from China. Apple juice concentrate, which many people feed their children, um, a lot of that will come from China. Um, codfish, processed mushrooms, frozen spinach, garlic are among, among the foods that we buy in large quantities from China. And some, recently there, there was a deal uh, between the comp U.S. company Smithfield Farms and uh, the Shuanghui company in China. This was the largest purchase, um, the, US, the largest deal uh, by a, a Chinese company for purchasing a U.S. one. And so Shuanghui was purchased in September for $7.1 billion. And the idea behind this purchase is to supply China's growing need for meat. So China doesn't have enough water and enough grain to produce enough meat for its uh, increasingly wealthy population. And so they wanted to buy this company to export U.S. pork primarily to the U.S. But and there's possibility of other price processed items um, being part of the deal in the future. But Shuanghui was a company that faced a, a scandal and that formaldehyde was found in its pork blood products. Pork blood products are a part of Chinese cuisine and so this was, this was a product affecting the Chinese market, not typically exported. So, but this raised concerns at the time of the approval of this deal about what this might mean for U.S. food safety if products from this deal were available in the U.S. market. And then on our side in the U.S., we have changed some, we're trying to change some regulations dealing with poultry processing. So the USDA announced that processed chicken could be imported from China. So um, once you buy this processed chicken, let's say you buy a can of chicken noodle soup, that, that would, the chicken in there would be processed chicken. And so you would not know buying the can of soup that where the chicken came from according to this new law. Um, and, and also at the same time, the USDA has, has enabled poultry companies um, in the United States as well as overseas to be responsible for inspecting their products. And there have been a lot of problems with US poultry companies. So a lot of people have been up, upset about this in terms of US poultry companies having this um, this uh, new authority, but if you think of Chinese poultry, that's a country that had several waves of bird flu, and has uh, the poultry industry has been um, accused of preventively um, inoculating its chickens with antibiotics to prevent bird flu, which could in the future make them immune to further inoculations. And this is a big concern in terms of antibiotics in poultry and um, their appearance in the U.S. food chain without any labeling. Okay, so what about Oregon? Okay, uh, I thought I'd include a local section because you're, you're all probably very nervous at this point, uh, but <laughs> not to worry because Oregon is an agricultural exporter and doesn't import a lot of food products from China in terms of agriculture or seafood. The imports are mostly machinery, metals, plastics. Um, agricultural imports are very small, 0.4%, 1.5% in 
what I could determine from 2012. So $12 million, a very tiny amount. Uh, and Argon similarly exports mostly uh, similar kinds of products. And so now I thought I'd talk about wine, because at the same time, um, I mentioned you have a growing middle class in China that's uh, concerned about food safety. Well, they're also interested in wine and interested in buying wine, and Oregon produces wine. So right there, it seems like an opportunity. Oregon can sell wine, Chinese directors can, can um, experience Oregon wine. But the, uh, another issue connected to food safety is counterfeiting of products. And so I thought I'd say a few words about wine counterfeiting and the possible risks that that may pose. Uh, so, um, if we look at where China's wine imports come from, France and Australia, the top two uh, sources of wine, the U.S. has the 4% market share there. Um, and um, Oregon has become more of a player uh, since uh, 2008 when Hong Kong uh, removed its excise tax on wine imports. It used to have an 80% excise tax, which made buying wine very expensive there. And Hong Kong is a big re-export market for the rest of China. So the Hong Kong market was crucial as an entry point. And I remember myself going to a wine tasting of Oregon wines in 2002 or 2003 in Hong Kong. It was completely in Cantonese, um, this wine tasting, so I didn't understand a word of it, not speaking Cantonese. But people looked very interested in Oregon wines, and the, the guy who went on to uh, sell these wines moved to, to southern China and is, has become an importer of wines, probably using his Hong Kong connections to access the southern Chinese market. And so, June 2010, Oregon and Washington State signed an agreement with Hong Kong to boost wine sales. And so, uh, seeing that this is an opportunity to improve Oregon's position in that market. But, it's not so great to be a leader in the Chinese market. So this is, this is a bottle of Romani <laughs> Conti, which is uh, one of Burgundy's most famous uh, wine producers in France. So it's a burgundy region, but if you look carefully at this bottle, there are a number of very strange features on this label. For one thing, this wine is declared both a dry white wine and a dry red wine. <laughs> it's a unique vintage in that way. And so inside the little circle it says red wine, and above it it says white wine. Also, this famous burgundy happens to be produced in a completely different region, which is called Languedoc on the label there, which is in southwestern France. And Burgundy is in, in north central France. So the region is wrong, the grape is wrong, and also there is a logo from rival producer Chateau Lafitte. <laughs> uh, how is this? And that's because wine counterfeiting is emerging as a huge business in China. And um, there's a resale market for empty bottles. So an empty wine bottle. Um, uh, are there um, an example of a place in the world where there is country of origin labeling that extends beyond meat? And does that, does that work well? And do you think that it would be a good idea for here? Well, we have country of origin labeling on produce and fruits, uh, vegetables. Uh, so if you go to the supermarket or the fish store, you will see country of origin labeling on these products. Um, but if you go to the processed food aisle, that's where you don't see that. The European Union has some stricter rules than we do, but I don't think anyone really could, could, um, could give country of origin labeling for processed food. You'd have to have some kind of barcode scanning mechanism where the consumer would be able to scan it and see all of the country of origin. But then you have to know what batch product did you have and what country's product was in that batch. And I don't know the companies want to give out that information. So. Yes. Is uh, China going through the same kind of change that occurred over the years after publication of the jungle that we did here? I mean, you know, the, the food uh, 
pollution that was portrayed there was certainly, you know, made everybody sick. But will China go through that same process with it? Um, regulate? Yeah, and that's what the Chinese government likes to point out, that China's a developing country and that this is going to take time. But China is also the second largest economy in the world. And so there, what happens there now affects all of us immediately. So the, the time frame is just isn't there for them to work on it. Because when, in the early part of the 20th century, when we had this problem, we, we weren't a global exporter to the same degree that China is. And we also had media that could report on these issues. We had consumer movement. We had NGOs. Uh, so we, and we had the rule of law, we could sue companies for harming you, and in China you don't have that. You can't make class action suits against companies. Some of the parents um, who had children that were sickened by the infant formula in 2008 tried to sue, and uh, they were not successful in that. Uh, the government gave them a settlement, depending on the, whether they lost a child or they had a, a sick child. But they could not, they tried in Hong Kong, they tried in other courts, they couldn't get any settlement. And some of the parent organizers were put under house arrest, or uh, it, was, it, was, it was seen as a threat to the political stability of the regime. That was the problem. Uh, that, and, and it's a big disincentive, because on the one hand, the government is trying to encourage whistleblowers to report on food safety violations. On the other hand, if you start organizing about food safety, then you risk imprisonment in China or other penalties. What percentage of pharmaceuticals are currently produced in China? Jared, do you? Well, the, the figure I have is 5% of, 5 of, um, of our imports from China are, from, are pharmaceuticals and biologics. I don't know, and we have no way of knowing when you buy your high-priced medicine, what the country of origin of the ingredients in that medicine are. Uh, so that's another gray area. We just don't have that information, and no one is going to tell us that information. Um, and of course, pharmaceutical companies have no interest in having their consumers die from their products, so they try to regulate them. But it, it's very difficult. And there's a lot of corruption in the Chinese pharmaceutical industry as well. And so it's, it's a hard problem. And we are seeing increasing amounts of ingredients from China for medicines, vitamins, nutritional supplements, and the like, um, which we don't have country of origin information about. Yes. I don't know whether it compared, you know, this today, uh, this week's big uh, scandal in Taiwan is the uh, same thing with the oil. And they've taken a very much larger thing towards it, you know, huge fines, sort of like. Uh, Exxon Valdez and stuff like this, that they, they do tremendous things to make a, a real point of it. Now, is with, they're also fairly uh, decentralized. So how, how effective would that sort of thing be in China itself? Well, Taiwan's much smaller. Yeah, it's, it's right, like, right. right. So their market is smaller, and they're less uh, part of this huge supply chain than mainland is. China has tried with that. In, in fact, some of the middlemen in the melamine scandal and in infant formula were executed. And people got long prison sentences. Um, but the, the profit margins in the food industry are, are small. And so unscrupulous operators will try to get around. Um, they think they're not going to be caught. And maybe they won't be, because the, the problem is so vast. And so even the melamine, where there's a lot of scrutiny, you, you saw melamine appearing in milk products for several years after the, the scandal was revealed. Uh, 2012, you saw some. And you, so you had products that were pulled off the shelves and then they were reintroduced or, or um, appearing in other markets or something like that. So, um, you know, Taiwan is, has, is a democratic country. They have a, freer, a free press. And they have a more active civil society, and so they have a different situation than in the mainland, where, where it's much harder to call attention to these kinds of things. Yeah, I, you know, I was very interested in the statistics that you presented on um, foods imported from China to the U.S. You know, 50 percent of the apple juice concentrate and so forth. <coughs> and you know, in, in light of the uh, 
media coverage of food safety scandals in China and the USA, which is extensive as far as I can see. Do you think that uh, American consumers, that, I mean, it surprises me, I'm interested if it surprises you, that American consumers don't seem to be expressing a lot of concern about imported food from China. If, you know, 80% of the tilapia everyone is eating is, is from China and contaminated fish farming in China is something that I've probably read about half a dozen times. Does, are, 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 is it interesting to you, the, the consumer response in the U.S. that doesn't seem to express much concern? Well, tilapia is the cheapest fish you can buy. Right. So, you know, <laughs> honestly, if you go to the fish market, it's the cheapest fish. So if you're buying the cheapest fish, you might not have alternatives to that tilapia that you're buying here. So I think there's, there's a discrepancy in this country, too, about what kind of food people can buy and who has choices. Who's going to the farmer's market? Who's going to the to the Safeway? And um, who's who can decide whether they're going to buy wild fish or, or farmed fish? And I, I think that there are price point issues that people have, and and people who have lower price points might not be as concerned about these issues. You're trying to get food on the table for the family. Um, and I think also if if you go to the dollar stores that are in, that are in many areas. That's where you get a lot of these products that China sells to other markets and then come back. Um, so the, the lower priced items might have more of these, more of these kinds of uh, risks. Um, and I think some people are very aware and some people are less aware and have other concerns. It's just, I think it's an economic problem as well as one of the awareness. Yes. Thank you. Um, on the matter of the, um, the Chinese chicken and chicken soup. Did we start working on that by writing to like our Congress people? Yes, and Congress has been concerned about that. You know, why should why should this rule be changed? And and what and our representatives are concerned about is why is it that um, poultry companies are going to be responsible for certifying the food safety of poultry? Because, I mean, I can deal with eating fresh spinach, but chicken soup, when you have to go, you, you know, you go around and you get to help. Uh, now I can't eat chicken soup anymore. And Buy a chicken. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, you have to think about these things. Yeah. Okay. Does that 80% of the tilapia sold in the United States, or 80% of the tilapia imported yeah. from outside the United States is imported? You know, 80% of the tilapia found in the U.S. These are, so, in terms of how much, right. Not in Oregon. Not in Oregon, no. And these are for the U.S. as a whole. As I said, Oregon is in the lucky position of being a food exporting state. <laughs> so, I, but, but if you're gonna buy processed foods though, and that, I mean, I'm talking about um, meat, vegetables, and such, that Oregon doesn't import a lot of. The processed foods, are here in this market just as in other markets. Yes? About the USDA question, is that a change that's in process right now under the Obama administration, or is it set complete that the poultry producers can decide whether their own products are safe and clean? That's something that's, that's been proposed. It has not yet been uh, allowed. Do you know who proposed it? I mean, is it a lobbyist issue, or is it an Obama administration? Well, I, I, I am sure it's not the Obama administration proposing it. And one, one issue is, is the uh, cost effectiveness of inspections. Because the FDA is not the favorite agency in Congress. Um, and so the, the Obama administration requested a higher funding amount for the FDA. and. Even with that higher funding amount, it's still a drop in the bucket in terms of the inspection problem. And so they're trying to think of ways in which you can expand the amount of number of inspections without increasing the cost to the government. And so, so what are the fox to guard the Exactly, hire the fox. Right? Who are you talking about? Then you get fox meat. <laughs> 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 